So basically, when we talk about the lunge, you know, a lot of our clients or a lot of exercisers in general cringe. And it's simply because what does what when people think of the lunge, what do they think of? What's the first thing that they think of? Knee pain. Knee pain. Very good. Well, today what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about why we incorporate the lunge or the split squat, which is sometimes referred to as a lunge. Why do we incorporate it into an exercise program? When to incorporate it into an exercise program? We're going to talk about triple extension. We're going to talk about troubleshooting a lunge and where people have these uh, ailments that cause them pain. We're going to talk about common client complaints regarding the lunge. That's where your knee pain comes in. We're going to talk about prerequisites of a proper lunge or a split stance. Okay, what people need to do or to exhibit before we uh, get them involved in a lunge type of exercise. Okay. And then we're going to talk about proper cueing. So on your behalf, as the coach or the personal trainer, what things are you supposed to look for when your client or yourself is performing a lunge? Okay, because a lot of it is, has to do with the instruction and making sure that you pinpoint the right types of things out when they're performing or executing the lunge. And lastly, the, the numerous variations and progressions involving um, a lunge. Okay? Now, before I go on, I got a lot of my resources um, from authors, and I just want to know a couple of them, some of these things that you can possibly, uh, after today, check out on your own. Uh, Bulletproof Knees by Mike Robertson, which is an electronic ebook. Maximum Strength by Eric Cressy, which is a book. Advanced in Functional Training by Michael Boyle. Uh, Core Performance by Mark Verstegen. And The Truth About Unstable Surface Training, which is an also awesome ebook. Um, by Eric Presley. Okay, so where did the lunge come from? Okay. Uh, the lunge really originated from like a split squat type of position, like in a split jerk back in the old strongman days. And, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they it revolutionized into a lower leg exercise that you could use to do thousands of, of compound exercises or complex exercises or lower body exercises. The verb lunge means to make sudden thrust or forward or propulsion, also like a lurch or a charge uh, or a rush forward. Now, what does a really good lunge look like? Okay, so we have we have erectors or tight, the back muscles. We have maximum glute extension, so the glutes are really working really, really uh, to their potential. We have a nicely dorsiflexed ankle. And then we have a nice active stretch in the hip flexor here of the opposite leg. We have a very good propulsion point. And then we have a very good flex knee. So you can see the knee gently goes almost to the toe. And you have a really good stretch out of the rest of the lower body. Okay? Now, what are some of the perceived pros and cons of a lunge? Number one, pros. Numerous variations. We all know that. Okay, we're going to go over those at the end of the, of the presentation, but there are a lot of lunge uh, variations that you can incorporate. Number two, no equipment needed. Okay, you really can use lunges for body weight exercises, for boot camps, for outdoor stuff, for group exercise stuff, and a lot of the lunge is actually in a lot of these um, programs. Because of the lunge being a triple extension exercise, meaning it uses a lot of joints, it's a big bang for your buck type of exercise, meaning you get a lot of muscles working at the same time, so you get a lot back in return. And the lunge, believe it or not, can be employed in rehab, general strength training techniques, uh, sports performance, or even fat loss programs. Okay? Now, what are some of the cons of a lunge, some of the perceived cons? It's difficult to execute correctly, okay? It's difficult to execute correctly. Most GPCs, which are general population clients, can't perform it without having some sort of pain, and that pain is normally localized to the knee. And then lastly, it produces a lot of delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, so you, the, your client, or the exerciser in general, is typically sore one to two days after they do uh, a few sets of lunges, okay? True? Okay. Has anyone here ever incorporated or done a lunge? Okay, all right, so 
you would know that a lot of people that perform a lunge, um, usually you get a lot of soreness the next day, I think with any type of lower back, uh, lower leg exercise. Okay, L is for locomotion. Lunging exercise is simply control locomotion, propelling forward or backwards or laterally, and it's the power from move from place to place. Okay, now that is a very important movement, and why wouldn't we want to help our clients get better at doing that, from moving their body weight from one place to another? You know, the point of being a personal trainer is to really help our clients become better at what they do, performing activities of daily living, and secondly, being more active in sports and getting them more involved with doing movements and moving around them, because we know that exercise is going to help them um, become uh, healthier individuals. Okay, agree? Okay, what is triple, triple extension? The action of flexing, namely three joints, ankle, knee, and the hip, and returning to a straight or extended position. Okay, typically this is explosive or dynamic in nature. And the great thing with a triple extension movement is it generates power from the ground, meaning it's a closed chain type exercise. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so something like this, this is triple extension. Okay, like a squat option. Okay, then we can go into a lunge. That's triple extension. Okay, any sport always has an athletic position that starts like this. Okay, tennis, uh, football, baseball, racquetball, you name it, every sport. Okay, so the great benefits of a lunge are simply because you have this triple extension action. So what we need to do is we need to unfuse a lot of our clients and get them to bend these joints a little bit. Okay, because a lot of the time they can't move these joints around. Now triple extension in the weight room. Typically in triple extension you normally see in Olympic lifts. Okay? Um, power lifting, except for maybe the bench press. But a lot of the lower body stuff you'll see triple extension. In the weight room, you see it in split squats, which is a stationary lunge. Um, you see it in squats, and you see it in deadlifts, as well as numerous other exercises also. Okay, does anyone have any questions so far? Good? Now, what are the benefits of triple extension work in any program, be it the lunge or the split squat? Number one, I said it's closed chain. Closed chain exercise are always the best to incorporate, okay? They mimic human function. They use the ground as a source to generate power, okay? Just like walking, just like running, just like going upstairs. They increase range of motion, okay? And the key with that is to really mobilize the hips and really get the hips involved in moving efficiently and nice and smoothly, okay? It increases mobility. If you practice a lot of triple extension exercise and, and, and perfect it, you get a lot of great ankle mobility, a lot of hip mobility. It improves single leg, single leg strength. So when we talk about the lunge or the split squat, um, it really helps out with building uh, single leg strength so that you can balance better. And I'm going to the next one, improves balance and stabilization. You know, really the key to training people with balance problems is not necessarily getting them on a Dyna disc or a foam or uh, an Airax pad or a foam roller or anything like that. It's really having, building up their strength in their lower body and then going from there and going to a single leg type of exercise. That will help them with their balance. You know, a lot of the clients that I have approach me and, they, and the first thing they want to do is they want to get on a balance board or they want to stand on a Dyna disc. Uh, or they want to stand on a half foam roller and, and they want to do a couple of these while they stand on a half foam roller and then fall and they get back on and they want to keep going and they think that's helping balance and that really isn't helping anything. That's really wasting a lot of their time. Okay, true balance comes from just being strong. So if you help your seniors get stronger, then that single leg balance will improve. Okay? Because if you think about it, a lot of the seniors that have problems with falls Okay? It's really because they're weak. If you strengthen that component out, the degree of falls or the risk of falls drops down considerably. 
uh, with any lunge and improves coordination. Right? Simply because you have to take a wide stance, your body, a lot of muscles and a lot of uh, segments in the body are all working together. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, neural activity that goes into a, a lunge. And it improves speed and agility. If you ever look at a lunge, it looks like a running position. Okay? If you incorporate speed into that, you could, or develop any, uh, if you develop power, explosiveness, this will help with running. And then lastly, because of the single leg stuff, I like the fact that the lunge also um, balances out the muscles. Okay, a lot of us put our clients on leg extensions. Okay, a lot of us put our clients on hamstring curls. Okay, and you create an imbalance there. Okay, those are non-functional exercises. Okay, they don't mimic anything. Okay, your body doesn't stand on the machine. You generate power from the ground. You accelerate forward from using the ground as a lever. Okay, so putting people on leg extension machines, you, you actually, you're not letting the body or the muscles train together as in unison. Okay, so when, you, when they find and start walking, it negates everything that, uh, that you just did. So basically, it's a waste of their time. Okay, I'm not trying to be um, crude, but I'm trying to be direct. And I want you to understand, for years, for years, I've been training for 12 years, for years I put clients on leg extension. Okay? And the sole purpose was to build their quads. Okay? But when research came out, probably I would say around 99, 2000, about functional exercise and really getting people to uh, strengthen their muscles in a systematic fashion so that they all work together as you would with uh, any activity of daily living. It showed that a lot of improvements came from Functional type exercises, closed chain exercises, compound exercises. Okay, the single leg stuff. The, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the single joint stuff is really bodybuilder themed stuff that we learned back in like the 70s and 80s when bodybuilding was really, really big and really uh, popular. Okay, its sole purpose is for simply hypertrophy. It's just to get bigger. We're talking about getting people stronger. Okay, strength comes before size. Okay, so what are the common drawbacks? Number one and the most popular is knee pain complaints. Everyone that you have doing some type of lunge movement always complains of knee pain. All right, and uh, trust me, I've come across it many times myself. But today what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn how to progress someone safely into a lunge type position and what auxiliary exercises they can do so that they will experience or we minimize the pain. I mean, you never really can prevent an injury from occurring. Let's get that out in the open. You can't prevent, we're not magicians, but we can reduce the likelihood of an injury occurring. Is, does that make sense? Do you agree? Okay. okay, most people that perform a lunge really can't have coordination, all right? So they really just won't be able to balance themselves, all right? They'll experience some sort of hip discomfort, okay? some type of lower back discomfort, some type of foot or calf pain or discomfort. They'll have single leg weakness, basically. And um, again, they complain about, you know, most trainers that I see, and I, and I literally meet about 20 new trainers a month. Okay, so you guys just made it. 20 list for March. A lot of times when I hear what programs they're making for their clients, I hear lunges in the first month that they met their clients. And then we'll talk about who their clients are, and we're talking maybe 40, 50, 60, 70 year olds, okay, that never looked up before, and they just want to lose weight. Okay, so the basic program is they want to do is they just want to lose fat. You know, they want to get their diabetes under control, they want to get ready for a big event or a wedding, okay. And the first thing the, the trainer will tell me is they, oh, they got them doing squats, they got them doing leg press, and then we got them doing lunges and then some walking lunges. And then what happens is, is these clients will start this, this lunge exercise and they'll have pain. But what does the client normally do? They'll complain a little bit, but they'll laugh because they want to keep going with you. You know what I mean? They want to they keep going. They don't want to look like a wimp, so they'll keep going. And then the next day, or two days later, they have a, the, the soreness that they usually experience. Okay, the, the, uh, the delayed onset muscle soreness. So then what happens is the client doesn't want to do lunge anymore. 
So you easily demotivate a client to keep coming in and working out with you. You have them experience pain, so then they, they, they relate exercise to pain, okay, which doesn't have to be, doesn't need to be, not the same type of pain you and I think of, and then they don't want to exercise anymore, right? And then what happens to them? It just becomes a uh, downward spiral of, of just, they get worse and worse, they get more overweight, and they get more deconditioned. All right, anyone know anyone like that? Yeah? I have a feeling a lot of people on here don't like to do lunges. Okay, why do people almost always experience knee pain with lunges? Okay, number one, the weight, their body weight is always displaced on the forefoot, meaning the front of the foot, rather than the heel. Okay, that's a, probably the biggest coaching cue that you can do, is always check out at the propulsion point, the front leg that goes out, where are they pushing their weight off of? Are they pushing it off the front of the foot, or are they pushing it off the heel of the foot? Because I'll tell you, if they are pushing it off the front or forefoot of the foot, they're gonna place a lot of stress on the patella and the patella tendon. And the and the uh, and the overall knee. Okay. The second most common uh, reason why they'll experience pain with the lunges is they'll take a shorter stride. So instead of here, they do this. Okay. They do this. Okay. They do a short stride. So what that does is that puts a ton. That makes it a quadriceps um, focused exercise or a quad dominant exercise. Okay. They don't take a long stride, they take a short stride. Okay, even when I'm doing that, I feel, I don't feel pain, but I feel the stress or the pressure is on the quad. Alright? So I'm strong, but my clients are not. So when I put them, if they do this, if I feel it a little bit, what do you think they're feeling? They're feeling it a lot. Okay, so that's where the balance issue comes in. Alright? Lunges are great because it helps balance the agonist and antagonist muscles around the knee joint. The general population is generally weak. Okay? Let's, let's, uh, listen. If they haven't been in a gym, or they haven't worked out, or like you get some of the clients I get that are 65 and they say they are active in sports when they are in high school, <laughs> and they're 65 now, you know, they're generally weak in our jobs and they are sitting most of that time. And then they want to come and they want to play golf. And they exhibit a lot of tight hip flexors, tight hamstrings, tight lower backs, okay? And they've been doing these jobs for years, years. And they already come with poor posture, okay? So the last thing I want to do is have them lunge. I want to progress them into a lunge. So I'm going to start them off easy with something that is going to help them uh, perform a lunge correctly, and that goes into progressive. That's, and that's a lot of the mistake a lot of people make. Exercises and trainers alike are guilty of is they they have their clients go right into a lunge without number one doing an assessment. Okay, I don't know how many of you perform assessments, but I do uh, assessments with all my uh, clients. I use a functional movement screen. I use a overhead squat to uh, really evaluate. Uh, ankle mobility, hamstring flexibility, and overall just the body coordination. Okay. Next is let, they lack ankle mobility and lower body flexibility. Okay. And when they're tight and you make them perform a movement, something's going to give. Okay. So you're going to have some sort of compensation. Okay. We all have some little bits and pieces of compensation going on in our body. Okay. Our body is a system of levers, and some levers are a little stronger than others, some levers are a little shorter than others. Okay. The idea is to try to minimize the effects that these, these uh, compensations have in our daily movements, because in the end, if that's what causes injury, are these compensations when other muscles have to do the work of bigger muscles. And that's where you have chronic inflammation type injury. Any questions on these so far? Is it starting to make sense? Okay, starting to be familiar? 
Uh, I hope you guys can see this well. So this is an idea of a quad dominant lunge and a hip dominant lunge. Okay, so you have the shorter stride here. Okay, so you can see uh, with the external load, the weight, and it comes crashing down. Bad word to use, but when he descends down into the lunge position, you can see because of the shorter stride, it puts a lot more emphasis on the uh, quadriceps. With the longer stride, we get more hip involved. Okay, and the hips are much more powerful. So with the longer stride, it's simply just a question of flexibility is how far back can they get that back leg. All right, and this becomes a little bit safer, but it puts a group of the force on the hips, which are much stronger. All right. Then this is what you don't see a lot though. But this is what you do see, am I right? Yeah, unfortunately. So when you get, when people want to start lunging, this is what they get. And it's because they can't get that hip flexor back. They don't have, either have the flexibility, they don't have the coordination, okay? And then sometimes they just don't have the balance, okay? Some of them can't bend the metatarsal back here. Okay, those joints are practically fused, all right? So the benefits of the lunge continue. Lunge into balance. So, like I said, lunging can really help with balance because the counterbalance load transfer. Standing is something that you can modify. Okay, but the actual movement is what helps. Okay, greater loads place greater demand. So, the more weight I add to a lunge, you're using dumbbells, kettlebells, whatever, you could actually help with the balance because you start to increase strength. Okay. And lastly, it increases reactive sensory. And what that means is it helps with the uh, uh, reaction time, reflex, and things of that nature. Okay? Lunge into a stretch. The lunge in itself produces a active stretch for the hip flexor. Okay? Anytime they go down, here is the active stretch, okay? Here is the active stretch, okay? The hip flexor and the hamstring group are hit hard when you lunge, so they, they're getting stretched out. And the great thing about lunging is because the body weight, when you descend down, the body weight creates that force that goes into a stretch. Okay, so it's just like if you had a client and you lay them down on the table and you take their hamstring and you force it up to stretch, to perform a static stretch. Same concept. Body weight lunge, your body weight is the hands that are actually producing the force to get that muscle stretched. Does that make sense? Okay, okay flexibility versus mobility. What is flexibility? Flexibility is a range of motion around a joint. What's mobility? Mobility is how well the joint actually moves. People always get those two mixed up, okay? If a joint that is immobile or stiff, the joint above it or below it will compensate, okay? And this is really a perfect example of if the hips are stiff, if people really can't move their hips around, the lumbar spine, the lower back, will move for it, so it'll compensate, okay? And in the next slide, we're gonna see. The lumbar spine is not meant to be mobile. It's meant to be stable, all right? But when you have people with tight hips, tight hip flexors, weak glutes, or what have you, then the lumbar spine has to come into play, okay? And the more and more it moves, and I'm gonna steal something that I heard from uh, Michael Boyle, is if you ever take like a credit card, and you take that credit card and you start bending it, and bending it and bending it, what happens after like 100 bends? That white streak shows up, right? That's like basically your lower back. And then eventually if you keep bending it, it breaks in half, right? Same thing with the spine, okay? It's supposed to be strong, it's supposed to be stable, but the more and more we, we have it move, we have it flex, then it, it weakens, okay? And that's really a result of people not having mobile hips, okay? It's really having a lot of stiffness. In regards to the lunge, the metatarsal, a lot of people can't do this. They can't bend their big toe up. You'd be surprised. I see this a lot in seniors. You know, they really can't lift their metatarsal up, okay? 
that it's so stiff, those joints are pretty much fused. Arthritic conditions, what have you, lack of nutrients. The joint stack, so this is really work from like Michael Boyle, great cook, who are, uh, great cook is a physical therapist, Michael Boyle is a strength coach. But what they came up with is the fact that the body is uh, a segment of joints that are all stacked on one another. And I always start from the bottom and I work my way up. The ankle joint is supposed to be mobile. Mobile in the sagittal and transverse planes. The knee, the knee is supposed to be stable. The hips are supposed to be mobile. The lumbar spine is supposed to be stable. The thoracic spine, okay, rib cage, mobile. The scapula, stable, shoulder blades. And the glenohumeral joint, shoulder, mobile. Okay, now, you'd be, if you can fix all these, clear cut blueprint, if you can fix all these on a client, you'll, they'll stay with you forever. This will solve almost all their aches and pains. Because on most people, this is not what's occurring. Okay? In most people, its ankles are stiff, the knee is loose, the hips are stiff, the lumbar spine is loose, the T-spine is stiff, the scapula is loose, and the glenohumeral joint is uh, 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 stiff. Okay? How many people here do corrective exercise? How many people here look at a person and kind of can pinpoint where they're having trouble moving? Yeah, you can see the imbalance. You can see, I just see them when I'm, usually when they're just standing, I'll put them up against the wall and I'll just look at them. You can, you can already tell when they have the rounded shoulders what they're already going to exhibit when you have them move. What's okay. more like chronic fibrosis? Yeah, exactly. A lot of them are going to come in with cathodic posture or lordotic postures. You know, and you see it all the time and you ask them what their occupation is and boom, one and one makes two and you can figure it out. But that's really, this is really a blueprint for, for all aches and pains. Is if you could loosen up things that are stiff, that will help out. What do people elect to do, or not all people, but most people and doctors elect to do? If a shoulder is stiff, they say, oh, let's go in there and let's, let's cut off that acromion so you have more room, basically. So instead of fixing the problem, they just kind of make a little shortcut. They're cutting out something so that you have more. Okay? You'd be surprised at the amount of people that I know and work with that have artificial knees, have artificial hips. I even met someone that had an artificial uh, shoulder. And uh, my first time I ever met someone with an artificial shoulder, I called her Bionic Woman. Um, but it was just crazy how a lot of um, titanium parts are being put into people because they get so sick of the pain or they, get, they grow frustrated by the, uh, the uh, modality and the effective, ineffectiveness of the modalities of physical therapy that they do, that they simply, you know, the doctor will say, well, I'll just put a new hip in there for you. And, uh, you know, I don't know if the doctor sees green or dollar bills in their eyes, um, but I know it's just, it's a lot of recovery after that. And uh, it's sometimes sad to see that they simply just haven't uh, met with the right person or they haven't uh, applied themselves or they haven't uh, found the right program and given a little more time to actually work. So, Okay, and lunge into strength. So anytime you lunge forward and you, uh, you propel forward, that's acceleration. Okay. Stopping it, that's deceleration. So we have a nice little concentric, eccentric uh, movement to the lunge. Posterior chain strength is going to be number one priority. When I say posterior chain, I mean like your glutes, your hamstrings, uh, your calves, your back, uh, your erectors, the whole back of you. That's the posterior chain, and that's the part of the body that's usually neglected by people that exercise. People that typically exercise, they will work out the front of the body that they can see in the mirror. Okay? So they'll, they'll, do, they'll do the whole interior chain. Okay? 
but they neglect a lot of the back muscles. And the back muscles are what will help uh, equalize a lot of the poor posture that they exhibit. And in uh, training with the lunge, we want to spare the quadriceps in the general population as much as we can. Spare the quadriceps as much as we can. Okay. In athletes, or in the youth, or athletic popu population, we'll go all out with the quads. Okay? If they present no pain, they present no discomfort, we, we, then we'll go crazy with the quads. But with general population clientele, we want to try to focus on the <clears throat> posterior chain, okay, the back, the hamstrings, and the glutes, okay? What are the needs of a proper lunge? So I have mobility, flexibility, and strength up there. So for, in order to have a great looking lunge, we need mobile ankles, mobile hip rotators, and we need mobile metatarsal. We need flexible hamstrings, flexible hip flexors, flexible calves or uh, gastrocs, and we also will need nice lengthy lats. And then strength-wise, we're going to need strong glutes, we're going to need strong calves, we're going to need strong lower back erectors, and we're going to need an overall strong core. Okay. Now, there are all different types of exercises that we can do that will um, focus on all these uh, parts of a lunge. It's basically really breaking it down and then simply, um, you know, piecing it all together to create this great exercise. All right. Okay, lunge prerequisites. <clears throat> In order to make a really great lunge possible, is we need the right types of shoes. Okay. Now, uh, no one's wearing them today, but remember a couple years ago, everyone was uh, into those Nike shocks, you know, the Nike shoes with the little pumps in the, in the back of the heel that had a little spring action to them? Well, the, what those really did is they really, if, if someone was going to, you know, do some type of lunging exercise in there, what, they were, what that really prompted them to do is to lean forward. So that really make them uh, press from the forefoot and not from the heel, okay? Because the, the, the heel is so elevated with those shocks and they're so springy that you really can't maintain your body weight down and you can't put pressure down on them. So a lot of today, the research that's coming out is uh, a lot of barefoot training is actually the, the way to go. A lot of shoes are coming out that are really just flat. Like remember the old Chuck Taylors? Um, the old, uh, what else are they? Chuck Taylor's uh, Converse, is that what they're called? Converse shoes, Nike Freeze are coming out. I don't know if anyone see the, uh, the uh, Vibram 5 uh, shoes, it looks like a foot. Has anyone seen those? No? Anybody seen those? They're shoes that look like a foot, and you basically, they're just rubber, and you just put your toes in there, and uh, it kind of looks like a monkey's foot, but, uh, and people walk around with these on, and, uh, you know, it's the less uh, obstacles or less uh, interference with the ground, the more your the bottom of your foot can communicate and really um, relay all that information to the brain on what about its surface and really will heighten proprioception and uh, a mechanical receptor response. Okay, we need adequate ankle mobility. Okay, which we know that we're going to do some drills today on how to perform ankle mobility. We need uh, great knee stability. So usually I like to do a two, two to one ratio, hamstring strength versus quad strength. So I always like the hamstrings to be stronger than the quads. Always like the hamstrings stronger. It's safer for the knee, healthier knee, better back. Okay. We need calm hip flexors. Okay, a lot of people will exhibit really tight hip flexors. Okay, so we're going to do some um, techniques to really loosen up those hip flexors. Okay, some things that you could do with your clients. We're going to free the hips, so we're also going to do some drills to help you really loosen up those hips, kind of like the uh, Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz, oil up those hinges. Uh, we're going to focus on some glute strength. 
okay? The glutes, the butt cheeks, the buttocks, very neglected area of the body, very neglected, okay? So, and it's sad because it's probably one of the most, not one of, but the most powerful muscle group in the body, okay? So we're gonna focus on some core, uh, some uh, glute strength, and then lastly, some core stabilization stuff, core strength stuff, okay? Some of the stuff you probably already have seen or probably already know, of course, they believe your planks, your hip bridges, stuff like that, okay? Ask yourself, what is prohibiting my client from achieving a perfect lunge, okay? Is it in the ankles? Is it, in the, is it the glutes? Is it core related? Or simply, is it too advanced at this stage in their program, okay? So the next time, you're in the gym or you're working out and either you are doing lunges, you see someone else doing lunges, or your client is doing lunges. Ask yourself, watch what they're doing. Where's the problem? Is it in the ankles? Is it in the butt? Is it related to the core? Or is it simply, are they not conditioned enough or in shape enough to be performing that type of exercise? Okay, and I'll tell you right now, you walk into any group exercise class, in any gym at 5 o'clock during the week, and you will see a lunge is going on, or some sort of a lunge in a, a group exercise class, and, I will, and you can pinpoint who's having pain and who's not, okay? Because if they can't go down deep enough, you know it's because they're having some type of pain or they have some sort of inflexibility that's prohibiting them from performing the lunge correctly. And the disadvantage with group exercises is unfortunately the instructor can't walk around and pinpoint to every single body. You just have to go with the flow and modify by normal. Okay? Modifying doesn't teach good, great technique or the right technique. It just simply compensates for the time being. Basically, that's what modifications are. They don't teach the right technique. It's just a modification. It's just a, uh, a compensation for the linear path that you're supposed to follow with an exercise. Any exercise. Okay. Now with that being said though, there are some people that already have medical histories, past injuries with knees. So obviously, you're, they're not going to be able to perform a lunge correctly. Right? You're talking ACL, MCL injuries, total knee reconstructions, things like that. Okay, no problem. Am I saying the lunges are the end all be all? Absolutely not. But that's, what, that's one of the things we have to consider when we talk to someone and we perform a medical history evaluation on them is to consider that when we design our program. Again, if you have scarring, arthritis, tendinosis, okay? What we also have to do if they met with the trainer, they worked with the trainer for years, and I, I see this all the time too, and I, and I get people like this too, is they, they've had a trainer and they can't, they can't talk greatly enough about their trainer, but then I'll ask them to show me some stuff that they've done with their trainer and it just looks horrendous. And the, the, the coaching, the instruction, or the camaraderie, the camaraderie is always great with your old trainer, but the instruction always sucked. So I have to go back and I have to reteach them the lunge, okay? If I want to put lunges in their, in their program because I know that it's going to be a more bang for their buck, it's going to help them burn off more calories because it's a complex exercise, and I have to teach them the right way to how to do it, okay? Because if they can nail that down, their exercise program will be 10 times better than anyone else's in the gym, okay? And then lastly, mechanically speaking, start from the bottom and work your way up. So again, when you're evaluating someone or looking at their lunge, always start from the ankles or the foot and then go up from there and pinpoint where the problem areas are, okay? Just like that stack that I showed you, that stack of joints, start from the bottom and figure out where is movement occurring, where is movement not occurring, okay? Any questions so far? So today what we're going to talk about, or learn about in the practical portion, is we're going to talk about uh, some mechanical troubleshooting. We're going to start with the ankle. We're going to just do some uh, mobility drills. We're going to do some transverse mobility, sagittal mobility, and then uh, if I have some tennis balls, we'll do some myofascial uh, work on the, uh, the bottom of the foot, which is really always really beneficial. If anyone has ever taken like a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball and just kind of rolled it down on their foot, it helps tremendously, it helps tremendously. In, or if you just get a massage on your feet. 
Uh, we're going to talk about knee pain or the knee complex and why we need a healthy knee first. And we need a strong quad and, and a strong hamstring. And then really, one of the best exercises that I've found that will help with uh, knee, knee health are step-ups. And step-ups, that's actually a whole other presentation because step-ups are also an exercise that will progress too early, they're done incorrectly, and they can also have uh, complaints of knee pain. But step-ups have been found to uh, really help with uh, quadricep and uh, rectus femoris uh, strengthening. So uh, one of the things that I'll try to do with clients is also do some sort of a, a low step-up to warm up with. So just to kind of get those muscles uh, awoken. The hip flexors, they're a common obstacle in perfecting the lunge and the split spot. No doubt about it, the hip flexors are always a big problem area when, trying, when people are trying to perform the lunge. Um, a lot of people need manual therapy, you know, they need massage or you know, foam rolling uh, in this area. And um, a lot of people need manual therapy, you know, they need massage or you know, foam rolling uh, in this area. And, Preferably followed with stretching too. So a lot of people that sit down all day will have tight uh, hip flexors and uh, most of the time they'll need a lot of manipulation. Okay, just a lot of, you know, it could be foam rolling, could be uh, massage, could be like when you can go to a, like a bed, bath and beyond and get one of those little massage uh, tools and just kind of massage that area out. And you'll find that it's always, always very tender to the touch. Uh, people that really have, have seated position jobs that they've been at for 10, 15 years. Uh, I want to show you a series of videos of foam rolling. I don't know how many how many people hear foam roll or okay, you know, everyone knows what a foam roller is. It's that long device uh, made of uh, compressed foam. Usually the white ones are the soft ones, the black ones are the more dense, the black ones are probably a little bit better to use. Um, and uh, really, this is manual therapy on the, uh, on the hip flexors. It's basically you're administering that manual therapy yourself. Okay. So we're going to learn how to do this today. Okay. Just a little active hip flexor stretch. Okay. So the weight is bearing down. And we're going to get a nice little stretch right in here. Okay? Because we also have a little hip hinge in here. So we have the hips uh, move interiorly and then back. So it's a nice little stretch for people to do. Nice big wide stance. Okay? Foot press the button to the ground and then lean forward on some sort of foam. Something to protect the knee here. So they're not into the cement. Hip hinging is probably a, a really easy exercise, but not many people can do it. It's simply just really trying to <clears throat> bend forward and back. And I'm using a, a band here. I like throw in a band uh, pole exercise into it. But it's really just simply just bending forward and then back without really moving or bending the knees too much. There's some people that I can actually perform this without bending the knees at all. Uh, and, and that just means they have really great hamstring length. Uh, and, and here, I mean, my hamstrings are not absolutely uh, flexible, but they. Uh, but the point is to really try to get to move from the hinge from this point forward. And some people can't do that. Some people will do this, and they'll go round forward without really straightening it out and going back. Would you recommend that over a shoe like deadlift? Or? Um, well, I think they're just two separate exercises. I think the deadlift, the stiff leg deadlift, I mean, yeah, the stiff leg deadlift, I think would, I'd teach first without the weight and then go into like a, 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 a standard deadlift. And this is just a, a really simple loop strengthening exercise. Just to really focus on the, uh, preferably the glute medius. Okay, glute strength. Like I said, the glutes are powerful hip extenders, so 
a lot of great exercises that you can do to help um, strengthen the glutes are the are hip bridges, uh, fire hydrants, one leg bridges, and step outs. And we'll go some, over some of these in the uh, practical portion. Some of you may already know. Some of them you may, be, you may call by a different name. So it's probably the same exercise, only I call it something else, you call it something else, but whatever, whatever works. So what does a glute, what does glute atrophy look like? So someone that doesn't have any type of glute uh, functionality, not, I wouldn't say glute functionality, but doesn't have a toned glute or a glute that's active in everyday movements. Looks like a flat butt. Okay, it looks like a flat butt basically. So these are people that sit down all day, your secretaries, your, your phone answer service, your uh, your medical assistant staff, people that sit on, in a chair all day long are the ones that have atrophied glutes. And they're the ones that the glute, when it's atrophied, it's not strong, doesn't function, doesn't work when it's called upon. And when that happens, other joints around it have to compensate, have to do the work for it. Okay? And, and, and sometimes these synergistic muscles are smaller and they can't bear the load, or they can't do the work as much as the big guy can. And that's when you have some sort of injury. Because what we're gonna have is we're gonna have poor posture in people. And uh, obviously this is good posture, and then we have kephotic. Uh, uh, this is a lordotic kephotic posture, okay? And then if you, this is an athlete, right? Imagine someone who's about 280 with that posture, right? So, I mean, this guy's muscular. Imagine someone with excess weight on them. Right? And, and obviously you know why doctors are always busy and the healthcare system is, is, is running crazy. It's because of, we have a deconditioned population that really doesn't know what to do for itself um, or doesn't really uh, know where to turn or gets misinformation. And or rely simply on drugs, okay, or wants it to go away by themselves, or they feel like they are way past the point of no return, so they just figure I'll just live with it, right? Yes. I actually have a client, a woman, probably about fifty-five, extremely thin, yeah. sits at desk all day. Her posture, her shoulders are so rounded. She literally is looking at the floor all the time. And no matter what I do with her eyes, no matter what we do, we've got to put her eyes on the wall, mid level, because she. It's, it's is it like a scoliosis? Or? No, it's just that's the way she's become from it. And she just walks in it. Yeah, you know, it's, How does she drive? <laughs> well, it's funny because she came in because it's a shoulder pain. Oh, yeah. It yeah. Just, like, yeah, it's bad. It's, uh, it's hard. It's, and people like that, I always refer them out to a, a massage therapist first. Really she do. does. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I always have them do manual therapy first. Yeah. They need someone to go in there and break up the tissue, break up the. I call the creep that fault that kind of start they start to feel. I mean, we all know you guys are all feeling creep now because you're all fidgeting. Creep is when you start feeling that stiffness setting in and then you your body you feel like you need to move and you need to fidget. Yeah. That's creep settling settling in. The problem is, is people don't fidget enough. So fidgeting is actually a good thing because your body, you're trying to break up that static uh, feeling that you're getting. You're feeling everything is starting to freeze up on you, so your body kind of feels like you need to break it before it actually starts to freeze over. You think about these people that have been secretaries or phone operators for years and years and years and years. They sit down at a desk every morning, they get in, they put their lunch away, they say hi to their boss, and they sit down all day, and they don't get up until 11.30 to have lunch, and then they come back and they sit again from 1 o'clock until 4 o'clock or what have you. And they hardly ever do any type of fidgeting, or they're way past the point where their body doesn't fidget anymore, doesn't respond anymore. And it just, they, they start to just adjust and conform to that position. They become that chair. Right? Yeah, it's pretty bad. And they have the worst the insurance companies will do it also. Yeah. It's, it's just like, oh, well, you just want to go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And the sad thing is, is they should have started doing that a long time ago. You know, you want to have a desk job? Great. But I, I tell all my clients, get up every, like four times an hour, just get up and move around. They, you know, they yes me, yes me, yes me. You know. Yeah, this one's actually walking stairs. I've got her going three times oh, yeah? a day, going out to the back hallway and up and down the stairs. And she's seeing you. Oh, good. 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 
What happens when the lever system fails? The spine, which is the, uh, the mothership of the body. Okay? Once the spine goes, it affects the hips and it affects the scapula, the shoulder blades. Once it affects the hips, we get the ankle and the knee affected, and then we get from the scapula, we get the shoulder affected. Okay? And I guarantee you, a lot of people that have shoulder pain really have a problem with the scapula. If you look at the shoulder blades, that's where the, that's where the problem lies. Most people look, always look at the shoulder. Never look at the shoulder blades. So, that's a whole other workshop. Okay, so going back to anatomy of a lunge. So, a great looking lunge will exhibit all these things. Okay? All these things. It will have a mobile ankle, an activated glute, tight erectors. It will have a nice flexible hip flexor. You'll have a nice strong knee. You'll have a nice mobile ankle and strong calves and nice length of lats. All right, so that's an anatomy of a lunge. That's what a good lunge looks like, but that's not necessarily what we always get. Now, from you as a trainer or a coach or just someone who has a workout partner and you want to spot them, you want to give them a few cues on what they should do in order to get that lunge looking good. Number one, they should keep that chest and shoulder pulled back, okay, and a lot of times, People, you have to depress the shoulders or the, or the scapula, really bring them down and keep them pulled back. We have to keep a tight core. I don't care if you brace it or you draw in. And um, does anyone know what I mean by that? Brace or draw in? Brace is like flinching, like someone's about to punch you and you tighten up. Uh, drawing in is you simply suck in your stomach and hold that in while you talk. So, which either way, as long as you keep the core nice and tight as you do the exercise. Relax the arms. A lot of people, when they lunge, they do this. Right? Especially when someone is holding weights. Especially when someone is holding weights. Oops. Especially when someone is holding weights, they will bend their elbows. Okay? So, number one, that tells me they shouldn't be holding weights. Right? Because the weights may, may be too much of a load on them. And number two, they don't have the form right, okay? The front leg should be weight on the heel, again, not the forefoot, the weight on the heel. That way we can activate the posterior chain, get the hamstrings involved and the hips involved in the movement. Bend the back leg, a lot of people don't bend the back leg, they do that, they do that short stride thing, you know? You gotta bend that back leg, bend it down. A lot of people kind of do something like this. They lean fall, bend it, all right? The back leg serves as a balance kickstand for them. Okay, so it's important to get that back leg in coordination with the lunge because that's going to be your balance. If you get the back leg straight, not straight, but if you get the back leg um, in the movement, coordinating the movement, then all the focus can be on the front leg, the propulsion leg. Okay, because that's the working leg. Okay, and lastly, a big mistake people make is need to create a space in the lunge, okay? Too many people do a lunge and they try to keep their two in line with each other, okay? And that kind of makes, that's, this is called an inline lunge, which is a little bit more difficult, but it, it places a lot more demands on coordination and balance. And when you're talking about sedentary people or general population, this is hard, so create a balance. Give yourself a nice little stable base, okay? So. That's a little miscue that a lot of people will do. Knees over the toes myth, and I hear this all the time from aerobics instructors. This belief originated from a study that was more than 30 years old. 1978, Duke University study that found that maintaining a vertical lower leg as much as, as, much as possible reduced shearing forces on the knee during the squat. The truth is that leaning forward too much is more likely what is truly causing the problem or injury. In 2003, University of Memphis Research that knee stress increased by 28% when the knees were allowed to move past the toes while performing squat. However, hip stress increased over a thousand percent. Alright, so basically the problem is, is that if you don't get the hips involved, they will suffer. Okay, and because of that, the compensation goes into the knee and then the quadriceps are not as strong as the hips. And you'll have a problem. Okay, knees go over your toes in any movement of the day. Okay, when you go upstairs, 
or when you do any type of running mechanics, always goes over your toes. Now, there are tons of lunge variations. There's a stationary lunge, which is also called the split squat. There's a forward lunge, the reverse lunge. Um, the reverse lunge is always the easier one of the two. Okay, the forward lunge is this, the backward lunge is this. Okay, the backward lunge looks like a genuflect. Okay, if you ever go to church, you watch anyone before they go into a queue, they lunge. Okay, uh, then there's a side lunge, which is simply a side squat. We're going to learn that. Cross behind lunge, which we're going to learn that. There's the lunge with rotation. There's walking lunges, which I see, I see in my gym all the time. These always rehearse up at the top. Trainers always have their clients perform a walking lunge before they even get a stationary lunge first, which is a big mistake. Big mistake. Okay? Then there's reverse walking lunges. Then there's something called the lunge matrix, which is going to be a bunch of lunges. And then there's a last, there's lunge jumps with stabilization. Okay? Which is more of an athletic type of exercise. Flexibility, good joint mobility, attention to optimal posture, good coaching, patience, and some tolerance to soreness. Okay? Some tolerance to soreness. We don't want to scare people away. The thing that I've always found in training people is if I tell them what to expect before they actually do it, the less likely they are to, number one, complain, and number two, um, stop working out. Okay, so if you tell people right off the bat that they should expect to have some type of soreness or discomfort, but it will eventually go away. They can even take some ibuprofen or over-the-counter uh, Advil to help alleviate some of the muscle soreness. If you tell them a little bit of that and they come to expect it, then hopefully they'll adhere and stay motivated with the program. Okay? And a lot of times, patience, patience can be on the exercises part or the trainer's part. More so on the trainer's part, because a client won't know what a good, perfect lunge looks like. A trainer does. And a trainer needs to practice a little bit of patience, because a lot of times, a lot of young trainers that I meet take their clients and they break them, rush them right to a, a walking lunge or something like that. And it's because they don't have the patience or tolerance to really break down the lunge and teach them step by step by step, okay? You look at the lunge in parts and then piece it together as a whole. So a lot of trainers kind of miss the, miss the boat with that, okay? And keeping attention to optimal posture. A lot of trainers simply don't, um, they see the exercise as it's happening, but they miss the little cues that they're supposed to talk about. Say, it's one thing to see the, the exercise in action, but you have to keep your eyes on everything else that's going on. Because if there's one thing that's wrong, you have to spot it out. Because then you're simply going to, um, you're going to simply form a dysfunction into the form. Does that make sense? You're simply, if you don't point out something that's going wrong in an in exercise form, then you're simply letting them learn and engrave something into their nervous system that's incorrect. Okay, and then over time, the more and more they do something incorrect, and they do not know it's not incorrect, it will lead to injury. Okay, and most weight training exercises, most, are not, do not occur in the weight training room. They don't. Okay, if it's something that happens in the weight training room, it's an acute injury. And I'm talking someone tearing a pec or someone um, dropping a dumbbell on their foot. Most injuries are chronic. And those sometimes normally happen outside of the weight room when they're doing something, nothing related to weight training. Okay? Does that make sense? Nothing related to weight training. Most injuries will occur when someone's gardening, picking up a kid, shopping, doing housework, painting, or what have you. It's never when a dumbbell is in their hand. Okay? But, they're very easily will always say, They'll always affect the weight training. They'll always say that it has to do something with the weight training. So we kind of have to pinpoint where exactly people are having problems. And that's why it's important to assess a lot of our clients and see what dysfunctions they're having before we make these exercise programs up for them. Okay, so 
common deviations with, uh, with the lunge, they lean forward too much. So a lot of people will, you know, will do this. They'll lean forward, so they won't keep the chest erect. They propel off the toes of the feet, and I see this all the time. People will always press. The heel will come up off the floor. They'll have the bent arms, the slouched posture. The knee will cave in, okay? The knee will cave in as they lunge, okay? The short stride, which makes it a quad dominant exercise. The limited range of motion, and that's really not their fault, but it's really just a question of flexibility. And then lastly, something that is our fault is <clears throat> they're progressed <clears throat> too soon. So they're basically taken from um, something that they're not used to doing, and then they're made to do a lunge, and that's what makes it. <clears throat> okay, so probably an advanced version of a lunge. Okay, well, the lunge is actually moving forward, or moving back, or moving to the side. A stationary lunge. We just drop the knee down. That's what we call a split squat. Okay. A Bulgarian split squat is where you actually have the back leg elevated on a bench or something, usually about eight to 10 inches high behind you. Okay. These are a lot more advanced versions and usually I teach these to my really experienced exercisers, my really experienced clients and people that are into athletics and, um, because these require a lot of range of motion. Now, the differences between all three, the lunge, the split squat, and the Bulgarian. In the lunge, you propel forward and back. In the split squat, there's no propulsion whatsoever. It's just, just a stance, and then you just lower the center of gravity. Okay? It almost looks like a hip flexor stretch. The Bulgarian, you elevate the balanced leg. Right? So that's what makes it a little bit more difficult, because that back leg has to be elevated. So it really increases the intensity of that. Thanks, Dave. The lunge, more coordination is needed because you have that kind of... The split squat, more balance is needed. Okay? So coordination, balance. And then in the Bulgarian, you'll need a little bit of both because it's going to be an increased range of motion. So we have more coordination and balance here. Okay? Now, pain is likely felt in the forward leg of a lunge. Not always, but most. Some people will also feel pain in the back leg. In a split squat, people will feel pain in the drop leg. Okay? Not always, but typically. The lunge is more novice intermediates, same as the split squat, novice intermediates. Bulgarian, much more advanced. Much more advanced. Okay? Any questions on these? Now, the great thing with all three of these things, you can always add a meat. Hold on to dumbbells, barbell, medicine ball, what have you. Okay, so the great thing is you can always add an external load, which makes the exercise a little bit more challenging. So what does muscle, what does lunging mean for fat loss? Number one, the more muscles you get to move, the more calories you burn. Plain. Okay? More muscles moving, more calories burn. More exercises can be added to a standard lunge. So that means you can lunge, you can lunge, you can do a shoulder press. You can lunge, do a bicep curl. You can lunge, do a lateral raise. You can lunge, do a forward raise. Okay, endless. You can do a ton of exercises added in with the lunge. And you get more time efficient workouts. You can get your clients in and out of the gym in less than an hour. Less than an hour. And if anyone's training over an hour, waste of time, waste of time, waste of time. You get them in and out of the gym in 40 to 50 minutes. You, you save them a ton of money, save them a ton of time if they can go home to their families or do what they have to do in the house or any other responsibilities. Okay? Because you simply take complex exercises, make them more compound by adding upper and lower body at the same time. Okay? You can all, all you have to do is teach them the body weight too. You don't have to teach them the weights yet. Okay? Let them learn the movements first. Okay? And then once they're established, then they add the external load. And lastly, variations keep the client interested and adhere to the ultimate program. Okay? No client must come in and do the same thing every single day. Nobody does. Okay? So if you change it up on them all the time, 
They'll, they'll stay interested, right? Who wants to come in and do the same workout all the time? That's how people get bored. That's how people drop out because they know what they're expecting. Okay. Sure, you should have people do some workouts, stay with a program for an amount of time so we have some type of adaptation fault come in to play. But after a while, you need to periodize the program and change it up. Something from an interest point of view and also from an overtraining point of view. Okay? Okay, lastly, we're all done. You want to follow me? Catch me on Facebook, you catch me on Twitter, you can catch me on my website, isostrengthtraining.com. Find some articles. I've interviewed tons and tons of fitness experts, and uh, I also have a blog, traineradvice.com. Uh, so you guys want to find out some more information on a host of other topics. I also uh, have trainers send me questions, and I try to answer them for them. Uh, you can do any of that stuff too if you want some more information. I've, I've interviewed J.C. Santana, Craig Valentine, Mike Boyle, um, those for videos, and a ton of other people. So. If you are interested, check it out. All right, we're gonna take a little bit of a break. I'm gonna set up the camera, I'm gonna set up your practical. We're gonna do most of our practical in here, okay? So get your drink, warm up, stretch out.
going to start with my left leg. I'm going to kneel down. I'm going to put it right above my knee. Okay. So I have it right on my hip flexor, just like this. So my left leg is getting the work done. Uh, so I'll wait until everyone's in the position. So place it right above the kneecap. Place it right above the kneecap, not on the knee. Okay, now we're gonna use, you don't need a lot of your body weight. So you're gonna use your right leg, the one that's bent, just to kind of drive up and down. Up and down, just like that. Up and down. Don't go below the kneecap. Don't even go to the kneecap. Up and down. Up and down. Okay, now, at the same time, you can turn your leg a little bit. And you see what I just did? Now I'm getting a little bit of the, the, I'm getting the quad, the outer sweep of the thigh. Okay, come up, getting the, the hip flexor. You may have to adjust the foam roller at times, kind of get it on the end. Okay, if these are really tender, you're going to feel it. Okay, if you're not feeling anything, that means you're not putting a lot of your body weight into it. So I stress upon you, make sure you put some body weight into that leg that's not the foam roller. Andy, you feeling it? Okay, so the hip flexor is going to be the front. You can do the side and do a little bit of the IT band too. Okay, so I just switched over to my other leg. If you want to switch over to the other leg, we're going to only foam roll for about 20 seconds, switch off to the other side, and then possibly go back and do it again on the other side. So I want you to go all the way up to the psoas, all the way up to where your hip bone protrudes out. And then come all the way back down the sweep of the thigh to the kneecap. This area is very tender for me. Very tender for me. Very tender. Now these black foam rollers are very hard. They're highly dense. They're not like those white ones, which are like marshmallows. These are very hard, so they really, really do a lot of work. Okay, about 20 seconds on each leg, and go back and do we're going to do it twice. Okay, so I, I'm going to go back to my left leg. I'll, I won't lie to you, the hip flexor foam rolling is, is the hardest to kind of get down. Because it's so painful and it's just kind of hard to get that area. It's kind of hard to get that area down pat because of the awkwardness of the foam. Okay, so I'm going to just roll it up and down. I'm going to turn my thigh a little bit. Okay, 20 seconds. Then we'll go back to the other one. Then we're going to go into a stretch. You can also do both. What's your name again? Jay. Jay did both legs. You can also knock out two in one shot. And just go right into that. And do two legs. So I say 40 seconds for here twice. Okay, now we're going to go into a hip flexor stretch. So I need your left foot out in a genuflect position. Okay, good. Now you're going to take a very big step, and then you're going to lean forward, keep the chest erect, core nice and tight. Okay, and you're going to feel the stretch right in here. Yeah, we can get into that. That's going to be the advanced version. So we can start off with something like this, see? Just rock it back and forth. Rock it. Rock it. Okay? Sometimes this may be too nagging for someone. So ease off of it, rock it back in. I don't hold stretches long with people. I hold them maybe four seconds, six seconds, and then I rock it back and forth. Rock it back and forth. Switch legs. Okay? Nice, big, long stance. Rock it. Rock it forward. Okay? Now, another trick to this is this here, fire this glute, tighten it up nice and tight, and then flex forward. So this butt should be nice and hard. And then you'll really feel the stretch in the hip flexor in the front of that leg. Okay, rock it back, relax it, flex the glute, bring it forward again. Good. Now, you can also use the opposite hand and you can stretch.
stretch it forward, you'll have to lean forward, and this will get a little more quadriceps. Okay, this is a little more quadriceps. Okay, now if that's a little too difficult for people, I'll show you a modification to that. Okay, this is more quadriceps. Quadriceps are part of the flexor group. Okay, now a modification for that is so going to take your purple yoga block. Place it right down in front. You're going to place your foot right on top of it. Okay? Now this, lean forward. Because of the range, this will intensify the stretch on the opposite leg. Okay? Everyone feel that? Okay. Now we can bring the lats into play too, because we want to stretch the lats out too. Everybody take a deep breath. Good, okay, now switch feet. Yoga block on the bottom. Okay, get it situated. Nice big long stance here. Interlock, stretch up as high as you can. Good, come back down. Awesome, okay, good. Clam shot. Everybody get to my position. more anatomically correct because you keep the cervical spine in line with the uh, spine. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to keep both feet together, sandwiched on top of each other. Put your other hand right on your butt. Okay, that's where you're going to feel the glute medius work. And then I just want you to open and close. Open and close. Open close. Open and close. Okay? Keep everything perfectly still and just move the hip. Just move the hip. Just move the hip. Okay? It's a little bit of a movement, so don't go too far up. When you really get it going, you're going to feel your glute medius really kicking in. Okay? It will start to burn. It will start to ache. Okay, now, I'm going to switch sides, I'm going to face the other way, and we're going to do the other leg. Okay, same thing, stack the feet. Remember, nothing moves except for the head. Nothing moves except for the head. Let's go back to the original position on the other leg. Now I want to show you something I've been doing lately with my clients who have a hard time with that exercise. Now that was a glute strengthening exercise. Now I want to incorporate sort of like a hip mobility with that exercise. So it's the same concept. I'm going to raise the leg up and then all I'm going to do is open it and close it. Open it and close it. And this really is just to kind of get that leg to open up. So I don't want it to move from the knee, keep the knee bent, but I want all the movements to occur right here at the hip, right here at the hip. So this is really going to mobilize the hip rotators, really mobilize the hip rotators. So it's not a turn from the knee, it's a turn from the hips. Okay, good, let's switch to the other side. Again, 15 to 20 repetitions on that. Okay, just raise it up, open and close it. Open and close it. Turn it. Don't do this. Not a big pat man. Open, turn. Open, turn. Open, turn. Open, turn. Okay, very good. All right, everybody, pick up your stick. Pull your arms out nice and straight. Really contract the chest. Hold that straight. Contract your glute, okay? And then what I want you to do is I want you to simply pull in, pull the butt out. Pull in, pull the butt out. Pull in, pull the butt out. So I really want you to contract the glute. Maintain 
force along the bar, contract, pull it out, contract, pull it out, contract, pull it out. Really get the pelvis to really internally rotate and posteriorly rotate. Now some of you may feel a little bit more in the hamstrings because the hamstrings will fire. Open, close, open, close. Stick the butt out, tuck it back in. Stick the butt out, tuck it back in. Okay, in order to do that, you need to clench your butt cheek. So you have to contract the glute. Don't just hang on this. Hold it steady so you get a nice little core activation here. Okay. Okay, let's switch legs. That's the point with cueing as a trainer, is you're supposed to spot these things. A lot of trainers will just watch your hips, but then they neglect to look at everything else that's going on. And the key to the lot of this is core activation integrated with the glute mobility drill that we're doing. Okay, here, hold tight, contract, pull in, contract, out, contract, in, contract, out. Now remember, before I have a client, Get into a lunge position. I want to just simply teach them how to get the butt or the glute involved in the exercise. So, normally I would probably have this raised up a little bit. So you need two risers on each side to give it about a six inch uh, height. I'm just going to use the standard bench, which is about, I want to say it's about four inches. Okay, so basically what I want to do is you're simply going to teach your client or yourself, place one foot on the bench, and then you're going to fire the glute, press up, come back down. I always like to put my hand on the glute so I can really feel the muscle working. Come back down, fire it up, come back down. Now, if you do this right, you're supposed to press down through the heel. A lot of people will press up like this, okay? They'll come up and you'll see a little bit of their weight shift off and they'll, they'll come up on the forefoot. Really press down on the heel and you can really feel the erectors and the glute firing in. Okay, switch feet. We're going to go back to down again, about 15 repetitions on this one. Okay, here's the glute. Fire it up, come back up. Fire the glute, come back up. Fire the glute. You should feel the glute fire first before the quadriceps. You should really feel the glute fire first before the quadriceps. Okay, so it's a one, two. One, two, action. Fire the glute, come up. One, two, three. The heel always stays down. When you push up, the heel always stays down. When you come down, the heel should even come up. If you do, it's just shortness. We'll have to address that later. Okay, switch to the other side. Okay, knee straight, knee over the big toe, come up, come up, come up. Don't even put any weight down on that, on that other leg. Don't even put weight down on the other leg. Just prop it up, prop it up. From the glute to the knee, from the glute to the knee, from the glute to the knee. Stationary lunge. So, nice big wide stance. Okay? Now, you're gonna draw your body weight back. See what I just did? So I'm not here, I'm back here. So I'm standing nice and straight. Now, I'm gonna try to keep my toes, my feet as straight as possible. Some guys, if we have tight hamstrings, our back leg is gonna laterally turn out. Try to minimize that, okay? As soon as you turn it in, you're gonna feel the tightness in your adductors. Chest up nice and high, you're gonna drop the knee, and then push up. Very good. Now, the working leg is this guy. I gotta take this, I gotta take this man out. The working leg is the front propulsion point. Okay, front propulsion point. So that's the leg that's gonna drive you back up, not the back leg. Okay, so it's here, down, push up through this guy. One, okay, push down and up. Push down and up. Okay, now if you're having problems, you can use this. For anyone that's having range of motion problems, you're gonna just squat down and up to the uh, yoga step. 
Okay, so if you have to use that, by all means, go ahead and do so. Okay, don't do too many reps. This is a split squat, what we sometimes mistake it as a lunge. A lunge is actually standing position, lunge forward. Okay, alternate the feet so it takes a little bit more of the stress off of the, off the legs. Good, just like that, awesome. Awesome. Okay. Okay, this is a forward lunge. This one is probably almost the difficult one to teach. So, the best way to teach a new client is teach them the backward lunge, which is a lot easier on the knee. A lot easier on the knee. Okay, so same thing. It's going to look like a genuflect. You start off standing nice and tall, take a step back, down and up, down and up. Now you can propel back forward, whichever you want to do. So normally with my clients, I would do this, come back. Working leg does all the work. Working leg does all the work. Back leg, take a nice long stride. Take a nice long stride. Do a couple so I can watch. So when you get tired, you switch legs. Good. Awesome. Make sure you press down through the heel. Press down through the heel. Good. Now what you can always do is you can do a front to a back. Front to a back. Does this look like running motion or what? And look, the work is all in that working leg. You do about 15 reps of this and you're conked out. Boom and boom. Boom and boom. Then you get weights involved. Boom. Okay, so you can see how complex the lunge gets. Good job. The side lunge is going to be called some kind of uh, side squat. So we're going to go here. Now I always like to keep my hands up for balance. Go back to the other side. Now the object here is to one leg has to stay straight as possible. Back. Lunge, press off, straighten back up. This is a side squat. Okay? Some people don't need to do this. I always teach my clients for balance purposes. You can get deeper if you pull forward. Okay? Now, side lunge. Step, out, return. Step, out, return. Step out, return. Step out, return. Other side, step. Just like that. Same thing, push through the heel. Keep the chest erect. Keep that back leg, that training leg, tra trailing leg as straight as possible. Awesome, okay, good. All right, so, so far, we worked the sagittal plane, okay? Forward lunge and back lunge are sagittal. Side lunge is frontal, frontal plane. Remember, there's three planes of motion. Now we're gonna learn a uh, transverse, which is the cross behind lunge. So again, we're gonna start here. Hands off the balance. Now watch me first. You're going to go here. So opposite knee, opposite. Come back up. Okay, now, if you don't have great hip mobility, this is where it's going to show up. But don't worry, you don't have to go as low as me. Boom. Boom. That's all. Okay. Boom. Don't worry about going as low. Boom. Okay, and so you really got to try to get those hips, turn those hips, and then out. Okay, turn those hips, and then out. So you should be able to see the side of your butt when you turn those hips. Side of your butt, and keep your body as straight as possible. That's why I like the arm. The arm is a great cue because I can't tell much when the client is doing this, but I can tell if they're being misdirected with the arms, okay? Nice. Andy, let's see one. Nice. 
Good. Good cue. If you see the stripes of your, of your pants, awesome cue. Now, what do you think this resembles? You ever see running people when they change direction? That's exactly what we're just, what we're just practicing. Okay, as a side lunge, as a cross behind lunge. So, uh, the lunge matrix, which I was kind of doing before, and it's simply, it's simply this. One, two, three. Now, that's something that I do. There's also a transversal. You go here, you go here, and then you go here, and you turn, and you go here. So, this is like a, a reaching type lunge. So, you go, you go reach, and then you turn, and reach. So let's imagine a clock face. We're going to go 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and then we're going to go about 5 o'clock. But the 5 o'clock, that's going to be a turn. So this leg has to be pretty mobile and try to keep it in the position as much as possible because you're going to turn your body so that one toe is facing 12, the other toe is facing 5. Okay? And with these, we can do a reaching lunge. So what that means is you could reach forward, reach forward, and then lastly, reach forward. Okay, let's try four on each side. So start with your left leg down, we're gonna lunge forward with the right. Okay, ready? One, side, two, behind me, three. Okay, good, again. One, side, two, good, behind. Good, one more. Good. Good. One more. Boom. Okay, let's see the other legs. It's hard with these pants. Okay, ready? Lunge. Side. Lunge. Behind me. Lunge. Very good. Again, forward. Good. Out. Good. Nice. One more. It's really difficult. And this is why it's, it's important to warm up because you really have to open up the hips on that third Component. You're going to imagine two lanes, okay? And those lanes are separated by a line. So there's the left lane and there's the right lane. You keep the left leg on the left side, you keep the right one on the right side. You can put your hands here, chest up nice and straight. We're going to go one, two. Nice, long stride because remember what happens if it's a short stride? It's all quadriceps, and that's when you strain the knee. Big step. Don't worry about going as deep as I am. You can do this. Okay? Do that. Now, that's the simple version. Step two from that, you have your clients in a prisoner squat position here. Open nice and wide. Keep the core in tight and that. Okay, so let's everybody get in a line. We'll start with Andy. We're going a big circle. Anywhere you want to do. Hands here, hands to the side, wherever you want to do. Big step. Don't worry about going as deep as me. Pressure down on the heel of the foot. Propel from the heel of the foot. Chest up nice and tall. Very good. And now we have a backward lunge. Okay, so here, I like to have my hands forward. I'm going to go with one, two, three. The hardest part is really getting that back leg to propel backwards, to get you back into a standing position. That's the hardest part. Okay, so you modify that length and that depth to work for you. Okay? Remember, you have to put it in the hips. Okay? Don't put it in the knee. Here, come back. 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 Okay? Hands here, hands here, wherever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. Okay? Andy, go ahead, let's start with you. Four stabilizations, we're going to do lunge jumps. Okay? Okay, now these are, these are probably most advanced. These are what I would want you to do with your clients when they are really good. They've been with you for months or years and they, they get shown really proficient. Efficiency in movements and really uh, good at doing a lot of complex exercises. Then you can throw in some plyometric type stuff with stabilization stuff. So now I like to use my hands out as a balance. So what I'm going to do here: jump up in the air, switch, land to stabilization, back.
Don't worry about going as high as I'm going to go to prison. Alright? But you can do a step lunge off of here. It's called reverse lunge. So you can do here, step off, get the greater range of motion, and come back. Greater range of motion. So this is like the stretch that we performed before. So we're actively stretching the hip flexor as well as adding a propulsion component to it also. Okay. Now, I just want to do this to demonstrate the complexity that you can use with a lunge. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to step back, keep the arms nice and straight, and you're going to rise up. One, come back up. Switch feet. Two. Three. I'm raising this up as I step back. So everything happening all at once. Keep the arms as straight as possible. Go wide on the, on the grip. Go wide on the grip. Go wide on the grip. Okay, very good. Switch hand grip. Be better if we had dumbbells. Okay. Now, even much greater for shoulder stabilization. One hand. Okay. Shoulder carry position. Lunge. Press. Come back. Lunge. Press, come back, lunge, press. For people that are really sensitive to kneeling, then we're on pretty good mats. These are quarter inch, half inch mats. But uh, you can use a towel or you can use an Arax pad. An Arax pad has light blue things, they're like big cushions, they're about two inches thick. Okay. So I simply just have people do this. Now say, Mr. Johnson, just bring out your left leg. And they would do a little bit of this. And that's the beginning of the lunge. And then they would say, well, where do I go from here? And I would say, press your body weight down to that front leg and come up. And in the beginning, I have a little bit of this. But then they got up. Okay? Then I have them drop back down again. Start here. Okay, swivel that hip back out. So we got a little bit of a balance, stabilization here, because at this point, we really have to stabilize on this leg. And we draw here. You know, they come out to here, I cue them. Let's bring that leg out a little bit. Okay, then stand up nice and tall. And then drive your foot to the ground. Press up. And then they would say, wow. I said, let's do it again. So repeating, then we go back to the other leg. So start here, nice and tall, swivel that leg out, press up. So I kind of got this from just watching people enter the pews at, at, at church. This is what they would do. I mean, obviously this is the, the, the genuflect position of it. But then from there I had to teach them how to propel using the ground support. So when you're propelling up, you should really focus on your pushing the ground down as you come up. Does that make sense? Push the ground down as you come up. So it's here, push down, come up. Here, push down, come up. And that's the beginning of the lunge. So this, with the limited range of motion that it is, will really help to strengthen the quads, the VMO, the vastus medialis, the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, and the vastus intermediates. The whole quad set. Okay? Do this three times a week for the first three weeks. Okay? That's all it's like a rehab exercise. And then from there, you progress that into you know, I like the reverse line, you guys can find it easier. So whatever you find easier, and then revert and then go into a uh, forward lunge or backwards lunge. The only thing you have to do with that is watch the depth of the back leg. 
taking in all those things that we consider ankle flexibility, ankle mobility, hip flexor flexibility, quadriceps flexibility, glute activation and strength, lap uh, flexibility, and core uh, stabilization. So you have to really take all those things into consideration. What I said is when you're, when you're teaching a client how to do a lunge, <coughs> and you think they got it right, don't jump the gun. Keep your eye on all these other things. Okay. Keep your eye on the coordination. Keep your eye on how they're doing as far as balance. Keep your eyes on how they're doing as far as uh, propelling from the heel instead of the forefoot. Because what's the one determining factor? If they get all of this right in the first three reps, what will be the determining factor going on forward? they can maintain that. So much like I said before. Endurance, right? Fatigue. Cardiovascular. Cardiovascular. When they start to fatigue, all that stuff will start to break down. Okay? So that's important. That's why we talk about conditioning. Okay? How conditioning is a very important component of overall health. Because you can nail everything picture perfect when you're good and you're not fatigued and you're fresh. But as soon as you start to fatigue and your body starts to get tired, the body doesn't care that you want to get this perfect lunge. It just wants to do the lunge and get it over with. So it seeks the path of least resistance. So it will do it and it will look crappy. And that's when most injuries occur. Okay? It's when the weight stack or the stack of the, of the joints are all mismatched. So it's keeping things tight. A coach named Charles a Palakwin, Canadian strength coach, says a set should end when the form breaks down. And I firmly believe that and I do that with all my clients. I don't care if we end on the seventh rep or the eighth rep or the fourteenth rep. It doesn't have to be an even number. It's, it, the form breaks down, the set ends. Because if you keep going into this failure mode, you're simply ingraining poor form into their nervous system. And their body will always deviate from perfect form and it'll always slide over into this deviated form, the, this haphazard form. Does that make sense? It always, you always see in the gym when people, if they're shoulder pressing, they look really good, and then they slap on all weight, and then they start to fatigue, and then they start going crazy, and their body says, two more, and it starts looking like crap. Because that's when they're going to have some type of injury. It doesn't have to be in the gym, but it will probably be the next day. I would get out of the car. Alright? And they'll say, I don't know any, what it was. But it's really it's years of just crappy lifting. And crappy form. Alright, so it's our jobs as trainers is to spot the stuff. Okay, so if I, you know, if you see someone doing a great lunch, keep your eyes on all those other little things. It doesn't have to be a lunch, it be any other exercise. It be a squat, deadlift, bench, you name it. Okay? And that's what really coaching. 